it was me walking towards my family and saying, what are you looking at? What's the matter? Why are you crying? And I turned around and looked and I said, wow, that's me. Wow. It, it looked pitiful to me. It looked saddening. It looked bad. In 1979, actor Eric Estrada was living the Hollywood dream, a dream that began shortly after he was cast in Chips, a television series about the adventures of the California Highway Patrol. But it was because of this very dream that in an instant, Eric's world would become a living nightmare. It began with a filming of a routine action scene. It was a shot where me and Larry, Larry Wilcox who was my partner in, in, on the show, and we're running out of a building, we jump on the bikes, and we're chasing a car. But then something went terribly wrong. And instead of being seated on top of his motorcycle, Eric suddenly found the 1,000 pound vehicle on top of him. The first one to my side was Larry Wilcox. It was obviously pretty serious, but I didn't know. And um, having been in the Marine Corps and Vietnam and all that stuff, I was pretty used to that kind of situation. And he kept me from going into shock as he kept me in the present. And he was quite helpful because at that time, my lungs were punctured. And I had a big gash, but there was no blood coming out of my body. It was all internal bleeding. And it was filling up my lungs. So I had to, I had to really suck air on my own. And then the pain to boot. And then the ambulance came, and I rode with him in the ambulance to the hospital. And uh, then it got really serious. I'll never forget it. I, I could see in his eyes death. And I've seen it. It's, you know, I know what it looks like. There's a fear in their eyes that's beyond normal fear. It's almost like the spirit's leaving the body. Though the finality of death loomed over him, Eric's will to live kept him conscious while doctors raced to save his life. They lay me down on a slab. They start cutting the clothes away, the boots, the uniform off me. I recall the priest coming in and giving him his last rites. They had anticipated that he had ruptured his aorta in his heart, so, you know, it could be in a matter of seconds. And um, they had to do either open heart surgery immediately or he would be dead. But then some miracle happened. He didn't have to have open heart surgery. But Eric's other conditions, including collapsed lungs, numerous broken ribs, and several unspecified internal injuries, required that he be transferred to a different hospital. So then I was, uh helicoptered from there to UCLA by the Sheriff's Department. And it was in the intensive care unit at UCLA where I had an out-of-body experience. The term out-of-body experience has become quite popular, but it is not a new phenomenon. One of the earliest uses of the expression dates back to biblical times when the Apostle Paul wrote, and I knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. The belief in a spirit or soul existing in the confines of our physical bodies is common in cultures throughout the world. But less common is the belief our being is in fact a conscious entity which is able to wholly separate itself from the physical body and venture out on its own. In Burma, the withdrawal of this life force is compared to that of a butterfly leaving a cocoon. The Azandi tribe in Africa believe that the separation of body and soul occurs every single night as one sleeps. It has been reported that the separation could be two inches, 2,000 miles or more, but there are limits to what one's spirit entity can do. It cannot be seen by those in the physical realm I was lying in bed in intensive care. And there at the foot of my bed were four people that I knew. A friend of mine from New York, my dad, who was in a wheelchair, he's always been in, in, in a wheelchair, uh, my mother, and 
a friend of the family who was dating my mother, and they were st they were looking at me, but they had really sad faces on, and my mother was crying. So I I got out of the bed and walked towards them, and and I was maybe three four inches away, five inches away from them, and and they didn't see me. They just kept looking, like looking through me. They were looking past me, and I turned around. And I saw what they were looking at. Eric's spirit was no longer in his body. Shocked at the eerie sight, Eric knew that the only way he would ever leave the intensive care unit alive was by re-entering his physical self. I think what he did to me at the moment was, I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like seeing myself like that. And I didn't want to be there, so I said, I'm getting out of here. And the next morning, I was taken out of intensive care. Reflecting back on the incident, Eric feels he had help in making the decision to return to his body. I think maybe I was grabbed by my guardian angel and, and was given a choice. If I wanted to stay, not get back in the body. But I choose to, to get out of there. Larry also feels that Eric's recovery was divinely achieved. I would have to say that it was a miracle and that uh, an intervening force uh, greater than human beings, and uh, in my lay opinion, that's God. Eric has never again had another out-of-body experience, but the one incident was enough to give him a new perspective on celestial beings and the afterlife. I hope that when, after my death, that I get to be a guardian angel to some youngster. Oh yeah, I believe in guardian angels. And there are millions of others like Eric who have experienced journeys outside the housing of what we call the human body. Could you be one of them? Is it possible, as the Azande tribe believe, that every night, our nocturnal imaginings are, in fact, ethereal out-of-body adventures. It's something to sleep on.